So hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture. This is another lecture of the course on cyber physical system fundamentals. In this lecture, I'm uh, teaching embedded systems foundations of cyber physical systems. This is the 13th uh, lecture, and it is the first lecture which uh, corresponds to chapter four of the companion textbook. Uh, just to remind you, this is the overall structure of the course. We have uh, started with an introduction, followed by a chapter two on specification and modeling. And there was a chapter uh, three on embedded system hardware, and we have uh, just uh, finished uh, that chapter. Today, we are going to start this uh, chapter four on uh, system software. What is the motivation for looking at uh, system software in this context? Well, uh, looking at uh, system software is motivated by having to respect uh, two conflicting goals for the design of uh, embedded and cyber physical systems. On one hand, we know that the design complexity of such systems is increasing, so they become more and more complex and they become overwhelmingly complex. And on the other hand, there are very stringent time to market requirements. So these products have to be designed very, very quickly so that uh, the vendors will not miss their, their, their market window. So we have these uh, two conflicting requirements. And if you ask people, how can we cope with these two conflicting requirements? Uh, there is always one answer, which I think is the key answer to, 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 those, uh, uh, to this conflict. And it is the reuse of components. Uh, without reuse, there is no hope that we can uh, design these increasingly uh, complex systems in the amount of time that's available. And reuse means that we have to reuse uh, uh, knowledge from previous uh, designs. Uh, and this knowledge has to be made available in the form of so-called intellectual property or IP. Many people uh, associate the term IP with uh, intellectual property of uh, hardware. However, uh, from my point of view, we also have to think of uh, software because software design also takes a very long time and uh, therefore we also have to consider uh, software as a special case of intellectual property. So uh, we did already look at uh, hardware. So in the chapter three, when we looked at hardware, we did implicitly discuss uh, hardware IP there. And today I'm starting the discussion of uh, software IP. And in particular, I'm looking at uh, embedded uh, operating systems. So what is special about embedded operating systems? What makes them different from standard operating systems? Well, there are a number of characteristics that have to be uh, considered. And the first characteristic is resulting from uh, the need to avoid uh, large overhead. We know that embedded systems have to be very efficient. Uh, so we should avoid any overhead for unused uh, functions uh, in the operating system. But on the other hand, we also know that embedded systems can be very uh, different. So they can be small, they can be large, they can include a huge amount of uh, functionality, maybe only a small amount of functionality. So therefore, not, uh, there is no single operating system which will fit all the needs. So therefore, we need some amount of uh, configurability. So that means somehow we have to carve our own operating system. We have to make sure uh, that we have a operating system which really matches uh, uh, the need and is not over dimension. So therefore, we have to think about ways of uh, possibly configuring our operating system. And there are many different ways in which uh, this uh, could be done. And I am listing a number of such ways there on the slide. And uh, the different items there on the slide, they are structured, they are, they are sorted according uh, to the order in uh, the tool chain. So first of all, we can think of using object orientation. Uh, for example, we can think of having a, a general scheduler class, and then from a general scheduler class, we could uh, derive using object orientation 
a scheduler for a, a particular scenario. We could, for example, be constrained to uh, time-driven operating systems. We could be constrained uh, to certain other subtypes of systems. And we can try to have a tailored uh, scheduler there uh, for uh, the type of system that we are designing. A second possibility is to use aspect-oriented programming. Aspect-oriented programming means that we are trying to separate the different uh, concerns that we have to consider in our software design. So, for example, we are trying to separate, let's say, error handling from uh, the regular processing. And then we have ways of uh, storing these different aspects in different files. And then during the software generation process, these different components will be woven in such a way that we have a resulting binary file that uh, includes all the different aspects here. So aspect-oriented programming is uh, one way of uh, deriving uh, configured uh, operating systems. Traditionally, uh, the use of uh, preprocessors is uh, rather common. Uh, we can use uh, preprocessor uh, commands like if and if def uh, to insert or omit certain parts of our software uh, description. However, it could happen that we have many such commands and that the overall structure becomes uh, not really readable and therefore it's usually um, uh, discouraged to use this technique because it works only in very of the simple cases. Uh, but if these uh, situations become more complex, then we should uh, refrain from using them. Furthermore, in this context, it's very useful to have advanced compile time evaluation. That means, of course, uh, constant expressions should be evaluated. But also, if we have functions that have uh, constant arguments, we could uh, generate specialized functions for uh, those uh, constant arguments, etc. We should omit code, which is not needed. So we should really have a very advanced compile time evaluation there. And proceeding uh, downwards along uh, the software generation tool chain, we can think of having a smart lin linker uh, that will emit the functions that are not needed. There has been special work in that direction. Only the ni linker is really sure which functions are needed, and uh, therefore the linker can definitely emit some functions which otherwise uh, would be dangerous to admit. In many of the cases, we have the opportunity to replace uh, dynamic data by static data. So, for example, if we know that we have a fixed number of uh, processes or threads, we can have management data structures there in the operating system that are just designed for uh, this fixed number of processes or threads. And we don't have to use uh, linked lists. We can, for example, use uh, static arrays in, instead of linked lists, uh, which could uh, contribute to the overall efficiency. Um, the fact that uh, configuration is not something which is very academic uh, can be proven by looking at uh, commercial offerings in uh, this area. Uh, VxWorks is a commercial offering in that area. It's an operating system that is frequently used. And there you can see that uh, the user interface for VxWorks uh, for the uh, uh, configuration of VxWorks allows you to omit or include certain features there, like, for example, advanced features of uh, symbol table components. You can have special handling there for, uh, the hand for the symbols that you have in C++ and things like that. You could include them or omit them. Uh, one problem that is uh, inherent with uh, this uh, very uh, far-reaching configurability is that uh, we end up with having uh, so many different variants of the operating systems. Uh, so you must think of having uh, an operating system kind of design procedure that allows you to generate your tailored operating system. And already more than 10 years ago, it was mentioned that for one of the commonly used operating systems, there were uh, between 100 and 200 configuration points. 
So if you consider the, the possible combinations of these configuration points, you realize that, that there is a very, very large number. I don't actually dare to mention a particular number. There, there is a very large number of possible variants of these operating systems. And as long as they are not formally proven to all be correct, you have to test all of them uh, once you have uh, generated them. So the verification is a difficult issue there. There is a second characteristic of embedded operating systems that uh, I would like uh, to list in this uh, lecture. And this is related to the fact that uh, there is a large variety of uh, devices that can be used in an embedded system. Uh, for a PC, you know that you will always have a screen, you will have a mouse, you will have a keyboard, uh, you will have a hard disk. However, this is not the case for embedded systems because there you're not sure which type of device would need to be included there. You're reasonably sure that uh, there should be a system timer, but apart from that, you don't know whether there's a keyboard or whether there's a hard disk. So therefore, we have to take into account that there are many embedded and cyber physical systems that do not comprise a disk, that do not comprise a keyboard, a mouse, or a, a screen. And therefore, we are not integrating the handling of these devices very deeply into the operating system, uh, but we are migrating the handling of these devices uh, to task instead of having them buried somewhere deep in the operating system. So as a result, we can see this uh, distinction between embedded operating systems and standard operating systems. For a standard operating system, we might uh, find the de certain device drivers there embedded into the operating system. So for example, if you have a Windows-like operating system, you will certainly have a driver there for the hard disk and, and for the keyboard. Uh, but for an embedded operating system, that's not needed. So therefore, the whole stack of software components looks uh, different there. Uh, you will typically have a kernel there, and then on top of the kernel, you will find device drivers. And it can even, even happen that uh, the device driver is part of the application and not really uh, shared between different applications. So in this way, the whole software stack is uh, somewhat different. Again, I'd like to demonstrate that this is not uh, some uh, academic view of the situation, but that this really corresponds to commercial offerings. I'd like to refer again to uh, the Wind River uh, operating uh, systems uh, that in include the, the VX works that I just mentioned. There you see that uh, we, we have uh, uh, the uh, reference hardware, and on top of the reference hardware, we have uh, some uh, standard software components, and then we see uh, the drivers on, on, stand on, on top of the VXWorks operating system. Over here, I think it's a little difficult to read, there is a VXWorks uh, operating system, and then on top of that, you have the different drivers, and it may happen uh, that uh, some drivers are not shared between uh, different applications, but they are used only by uh, one particular application or by a few applications. So that's the second characteristic. Third characteristic is that uh, uh, protection plays a different role in embedded systems. Protection will not always be uh, necessary. There are many embedded systems that are designed for a single purpose. Uh, usually, uh, we need to test uh, these systems very thoroughly. So therefore, we can assume that these uh, uh, software programs are indeed uh, uh, tested. And we have to assume anyway that the software is reliable. So therefore, uh, we can simplify the design of the system. We can try to reduce the overhead. Uh, in a standard PC-like system, I.O. instructions are usually not allowed at the uh, application level or not allowed in uh, the so-called user mode of the execution of programs. But they can be executed only uh, when the system runs in so-called kernel mode. And that means we are using so-called privileged I.O. instructions. However, in some embedded systems, that would be 
you know, uh, uh, having, uh, that would be constraining the designers too much. And uh, therefore, there are many cases where the applications can do their own I.O. For example, assume that you have a very simple microcontroller-based system where you would like uh, to check whether the switch, a certain switch, is turned on or off. There, it may be feasible to refer to a memory mapped address for that particular switch, and then you can lo use just a single uh, load instruction to get the position for, for that particular switch. And then, of course, the overhead would be much less compared to the case where you have to go through the operating system. However, uh, I have to agree that the situation in this respect is uh, slowly changing. Uh, because uh, there are certain safety concerns, we might ha have to make sure that uh, uh, the, at the application level we don't have access to certain devices. Uh, we might want to, sh to shield the operating system against uh, the instructions executed in user mode. Uh, we might con consider some errors that happen at runtime. Uh, so therefore, the situation there is changing a little, and it could happen that uh, for more advanced uh, uh, embedded systems, we will not allow uh, I.O. instructions to be executed in user mode. Uh, in a similar direction, uh, we have a, a certain char characteristic there for the use of uh, interrupts. Uh, in a standard PC-like system, interrupts can usually be employed uh, only by the operating system because allowing the use of interrupts to uh, application-level programs would be very dangerous. Uh, however, uh, for embedded systems, especially for, for simple embedded systems, it may be useful to allow user-level programs to access uh, interrupts. Uh, we can do this because we could assume that these embedded uh, programs are uh, tested. Uh, we have also just learned that uh, protection is not always uh, needed, otherwise we could not allow the use of interrupts at the user level. Uh, we also need to have efficient control over a variety of devices. So it could happen that we need a very fast response for any access uh, to a particular device, and there it makes uh, sense to have direct access to the interrupt. So therefore, it may be possible to let interrupts uh, directly start or stop certain software uh, by storing the corresponding address there in the so-called interrupt table. Of course, if that's feasible, that would be much more efficient than going through the corresponding operating system services. However, we also have to agree that there is a downside to, to this in increased efficiency uh, because composability is uh, reduced. If uh, we can allow any user program to connect to some interrupt, then it will be very difficult to uh, use a combination of independently developed uh, programs there on, on the same system because there could very easily be uh, a conflict between the use of interrupts and then we would be in a problem. And then it would have been more convenient if uh, the user level programs had not been able uh, to use interrupts directly. Uh, the next characteristic that I would like to mention for embedded operating systems is the fact that uh, they should uh, provide real-time capability. Many embedded systems are indeed, as we learned earlier, real-time systems and uh, therefore the operating systems that must be uh, used in, that are used in these systems must be real-time operating systems. So uh, next, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes on the discussion of uh, real-time operating systems. Uh, first of all, I'd like uh, to try to define the term. Uh, what's a real-time operating system? Well, according to this definition, a real-time operating system is an operating system that supports the construction of real-time system. Well, that's not very surprising, but it's uh, something that I had to say. So which are the requirements for uh, real-time operating systems? Well, from my point of view, there are three uh, key requirements. The first requirement is that the timing behavior of the operating system must be predictable. So it cannot happen that sometimes it takes a extremely large amount of time uh, to finish uh, a particular service. 
uh, for all the services that are provided by the operating system, uh, there should be a tight upper bound on the execution time, and in this way it should be easy to predict how long it could take until we have finished a certain, uh, a certain service. In this uh, context, as a prerequisite, we require that uh, the interrupts be disabled only for a short amounts of time, because otherwise we would have an unpredictable extension uh, of the response time to an interrupt, because uh, if, if interrupts are, are disabled for a long time, then it could uh, take for quite some time until we react to some external interrupt. There are more special cases into the same direction. I'm only listing a second one over here. If we have a hard disk there in our system, uh, then we can have problems with accesses to the file system because we know that the standard file systems that are used in uh, PCs, uh, they uh, allow for a scattered distribution of the different sectors belonging to one file. Now, if we have uh, to read the different uh, sectors there belonging to one particular file, from different areas there in, in, on the hard disk, we might have quite some time for the head movements and that means that access times would be rather unpredictable. So therefore, uh, for uh, real-time systems, uh, it's sometimes required uh, that these uh, files are contiguous, which means that they occupy contiguous areas of uh, sectors there on, on the disk. Second requirement for real-time operating systems is that the operating system should uh, manage uh, timing and uh, scheduling, which means that the operating system should be aware of uh, task deadlines. This is something that's usually not available for a PC-like operating system. A PC-like operating system is completely unaware of deadlines and therefore cannot take them into account, uh, which can even be a problem for PC-like operating systems. Uh, also, uh, the operating system should provide uh, time services with a very high resolution. It might happen that we want to uh, delay the execution of a process just for some microseconds, and then we need a certain time service that allows us to delay the process for just a few microseconds. In general, when we talk about uh, time in uh, real-time uh, systems, uh, we have to realize that uh, time, from a physical point of view, uh, is represented by real numbers. Uh, so if you ask any physicist, he will say that, well, uh, we uh, are using real numbers to represent time. But in computers, most of the time, we use uh, discrete uh, values there for measuring time except if uh, uh, you ask uh, some people who do some measurements of some, let's say, uh, experiments in high energy physics where you would like to know exactly at what time a certain event happened, so you might be using floating point numbers. But floating point numbers in a computer are also just discrete approximations of real numbers. So again, you're actually using discrete uh, values there for representing time. Then regarding the time, in uh, simple cases, it might be sufficient to have just relative time, which means locally in the computer, you just know by how much time has progressed. You will know well time has progressed by a couple of microseconds. Uh, for this, you can use a local timer. This local timer may be started at the time you boot your system. And then you just uh, have uh, some indication of uh, the differences between any uh, two points in, in time. In other situations, you might uh, need uh, a knowledge of absolute time, that means wall clock time. And regarding wall clock time, there are two different standards. There is the so-called International Atomic Time, TAI, uh, which is uh, derived from the uh, corresponding French uh, uh, term for this. Uh, the corresponding French term is uh, Temps Atomique International. This is a standard where time is only advancing. It's uh, advancing at, at a constant speed and it's free of, of any artifacts. So usually it's uh, arrived from uh, some atomic standard that's also part of the name. So as the name indicates, we are uh, advancing time at regular intervals. Uh, 
Then on the other hand, there is something that you might be more familiar with. This is uh, the uh, universal time coordinated, or UTC. This is something that you frequently see in your email. Uh, but there is a problem with UTC because UTC is defined by astronomical standards. And since the m movement of the Earth is not really always at exactly the same speed, uh, certain corrections are required. And due to this uh, correction, sometimes a certain correction second is inserted on New Year's Eve. And this, of course, is not without uh, problems. Uh, because if you are adding these additional seconds and if you are then writing a program in a not so smart way, it can happen that you get the impression that New Year's Eve or the, that the new year is starting twice in the, in the same night. Yeah? It, you can think of writing the program in such a way. So you have to be careful about these uh, correction seconds. Okay. So. Um, Regarding the use of time in, in the computer, uh, we do have to synchronize uh, computers if they are used in, in a network, because we have to make sure that uh, different computers in the network are agreeing on their notion of time. Uh, such a synchronization can be done internally, uh, just among those computers that are connected. Or it could also be done uh, referring to some external standard of time. So if we do this internally, we will use this uh, typically during startup phases where we don't have any connection to the outside world. And there we can use a distributed synchronization where, for example, we collect information from the neighbors, we compute some correction value, and then set the correction value. So uh, considering, for example, the situation, let's say, 20 years ago, where the different groups in the computer science department had their local computer network and connection to the outside world was rather an exception than a rule, there it was, of course, necessary to come up with a consistent notion of time for all the computers there in the network. It has changed a little uh, since uh, all the computers are connected to the internet, but still you can think of a situation where you have a local network and where uh, the computers there in the local network have to agree on their notion of time. Uh, the precision that can be achieved this way depends on where you try to synchronize. You can try to do this at the application level uh, where the precision is rather low. Uh, you can have this uh, at the operating system level where you have a medium precision. And you can do this in the communication hardware itself where you get the best precision. And it can, uh, uh, in certain cases, be needed actually to do this synchronization in the communication hardware because otherwise the precision could be uh, too low for some applications. On the other hand, if you do have access to the outside world, if you do have access to external time standards, then you can try to synchronize with these external time standards. Uh, so in this way, you would be consistent with actual physical time. Um, many, many years ago, there were different ways of trying to achieve this. By now, uh, the use of uh, GPS is rather standard because it's very cheap to refer to the uh, GPS uh, uh, time signals that are available in most parts of the world. Uh, GPS offers both uh, standards for uh, the uh, global time. The resolution is also pretty good. It's about 100 nanoseconds. If you require a better resolution, you can play some tricks. I know that there are certain uh, techniques uh, that uh, try to get you uh, below uh, this, uh, this number over here. And you can, for example, attach a GPS device to your computer if your computer does not already come with such a device. Uh, external synchronization is not completely without uh, potential problems because it could happen that uh, there is uh, some erroneous value that gets uh, propagated to all the computers in your network. Uh, suppose that there is some problem with the reception and suppose that uh, uh, there is uh, no fault tolerant uh, uh, encoding there of the messages and it can happen. Uh, that you get a uh, wrong time information there. And uh, therefore, in order to play uh, safe, 
in many cases all, only small changes of the local time are allowed. Unfortunately, many of the formats which are used for uh, transmitting this information are uh, too restricted. For example, the frequently used NTP protocol uh, has a 136-year uh, wraparound uh, cycle. Uh, this uh, time standard starts in the year 1900, which means that in the year 2036, uh, this uh, representation of uh, years will be wrapping around. And uh, we have to make sure that uh, uh, these, uh, the, the programs that are reading this format are uh, drawing the, the right uh, conclusions from this wrapping around. They should not assume that we are stepping back to the year 1900. Um, there are lots of papers, there are books on time services and synchronization. And for more information, I suggest that you refer to the book by Hermann uh, Koppitz. Uh, there is an earlier edition uh, published in 1997, and I know that there is a more recent edition uh, that uh, involves uh, the discussion of uh, developments in this area more recently. There is a third requirement with respect to real-time real -time operating systems that I would like to mention, and that's the speed. Um, the requirement is that the real-time operating system must be fast. Now, I have to admit that uh, you cannot really define formally what is fast. Yeah? So it's, it's very difficult to, to tell whether a certain system is meeting that requirement or not. But from a practical point of view, it doesn't really help if you're able to, say, guarantee that all time services of the operating system finish within one hour. Uh, this is a very predictable operating system, but it would be so slow that it would be totally useless. So therefore, in practice, you definitely have to guarantee a certain speed, but I agree that uh, it, it is very difficult to really define what is sufficiently fast. So these were the three requirements for uh, real-time operating systems. With respect to the different types of uh, real-time operating systems, we can uh, distinguish between uh, different uh, ways of approaching the uh, design of real-time operating systems. On one hand, we have uh, the what I would call real real-time operating systems, where we have a real-time kernel there at the very bottom, and then we have these device drivers on top, and we might have some middleware, and finally the application software. And on the other hand, people are trying to reuse available uh, operating systems that were designed for uh, PCs and there we have the standard software stack where we have device drivers there at, at the bottom. Furthermore, we can distinguish between general real-time operating systems and those that were designed for specific domains. For example, there are specialized real-time operating systems that are designed for the automotive domain and also other specialized uh, real-time operating systems. Also, we can distinguish uh, between different application programming interfaces. Uh, there are standard application programming interfaces like uh, the real-time extensions for the POSIX standard. Uh, there is a Japanese operating system called ITRON. Uh, there is uh, uh, OSEC, which is a standard used in the automotive domain. And there are also proprietary, uh, proprietary application programming interfaces. The functionality of uh, real-time operating systems includes a number of uh, functions. We need processor management, we need memory management, and we need uh, timer management. We need task management, and we need inter-task communication and synchronization. Uh, one special characteristic of real-time operating systems is the fact that these should be integrated. In PC-like operating systems, there is frequently the trend to completely decouple these different types of uh, management services. However, in an embedded operating system, whenever uh, the processor is allocated to a particular thread, we should also be sure that the uh, required memory is also allocated and that we also get hold of, of the timer whenever we need it. So therefore, we would need a tighter integration of the different types of, of management than what we find in a standard operating system. 
So next I'd like uh, to look at uh, the different classes of operating systems as they are available, as they could be considered for implementations. First of all, uh, citing Rajiv Gupta from uh, uh, the University of California at San Diego, uh, there are so-called fast proprietary kernels and uh, this means that uh, you have a certain vendor and the vendor is uh, designing a, a kernel that is designed to be uh, fast. But according to Rajiv, uh, for complex systems these kernels are inadequate because they are designed uh, to be fast rather than to be predictable in every respect. So there is no complete redesign of the operating system. It could happen that the operating system is just fast enough. It could happen that it's just sufficient for soft real-time requirements. And it can happen that uh, you uh, have problems guaranteeing a certain upper bound on the execution time. And there is a number of uh, offerings there in that area. Then there is a second class of real-time operating systems. Uh, and in this class, we find real-time extensions to standard operating systems. The key idea there is that, well, we do have a very convenient, comfortable standard operating system, and we would like uh, to use that as well for the design of uh, real-time systems. However, uh, it's uh, not that easy because if we look closely, we find that, uh, well, for this approach, we can take advantage of uh, the services provided by the standard operating system, but real-time tasks are uh, programmed in a different way. So we can have the situation that is shown over here where we have a certain real-time kernel, and then on top of the real-time kernel, we run a standard operating system, and on top of that, we can run uh, these non-real-time tasks. But the real-time tasks, uh, they do not run on top of the standard operating system, but they may be running on top of their device drivers. And uh, then uh, we have uh, these uh, programs over here at the application level. There are a number of advantages with that approach, but also disadvantages. First of all, if the standard operating system is crashing, this does not affect the real-time task. So if, let's say, this is a, a Windows operating system, a standard Linux operating system, and if it crashes, it doesn't really harm uh, these tasks running over here. They just continue running. So if Excel is causing that uh, program to, to crash, it doesn't really matter. These real-time tasks will continue to execute. But on the other hand, these real-time tasks cannot use the services of the standard operating system. That means one of the main motivations for, for this approach is actually gone. Because you were assuming usually that if you use the standard operating system, you have all the convenience of a standard operating system also available when you do the programming for the real-time task. However, that in general is not true. There are examples that uh, demonstrate this approach. There is uh, uh, one commercial approach that's available if, if you pay some money. Uh, there is a modification of the, uh, or there is a so-called uh, real-time Linux, which is a layer of software, uh, which uh, can be moved in between the standard Linux kernel and uh, the, the hardware. And then uh, on top of this uh, extension to the Linux kernel, uh, you can run a, a real-time task and these real-time tasks and then possibly also communicate between each other. And some of the interrupts are then made available to these real-time tasks. Uh, some interrupts might actually start uh, these uh, tasks uh, directly. And then on top of the standard Linux kernel, you have the standard applications that you can run on top of uh, standard Linux. So in this uh, scenario, the communication between these different types of tasks uh, would be rather limited. There are variations of that approach, variations that are not constrained by uh, commercial licenses. There is the so-called real-time application interface. Uh, for which you can find information there on this uh, website. 
Uh, there, uh, in this case, we find uh, certain fixes to the standard uh, Linux operating system uh, so that unpredictability is, is minimized. Effectively, there is a hardware abstraction layer that is uh, moved in between uh, the hardware and the Linux, and in that way, uh, we are also able to connect certain interrupts, for example, directly with uh, certain activities in uh, the real-time system, and these interrupts would then not be seen by the standard Linux system. So that was my uh, discussion, my presentation of uh, variants of uh, standard operating systems. Uh, citing Rajiv Gupta again, trying to use a version of a standard operating system is not the correct approach because too many basic and inappropriate underlying assumptions still exist, such as optimizing for the average case rather than the worst case, ignoring most, if not all, semantic information and independent CPU scheduling and resource allocation. We know that in embedded systems there are many dependencies between the different tasks. However, for PC-like operating system, that's rather an exception. Uh, so therefore, a PC-like operating system is typically not aware of dependencies between the different tasks. But for embedded systems, they should be taken into account. The real-time operating system should be aware of these dependencies. So there we see that for embedded systems, the situation is quite uh, different than for PC-like systems. Finally, the third class of uh, real-time operating systems is a class uh, that uh, contains systems that try to get around the limitations of the previous two classes. Uh, there are some research uh, systems that are trying to get around these limitations, and I've listed some of the uh, research uh, approaches over here, and I think there are more research efforts on the way in the same direction. Uh, there are many open issues for research. This is a list uh, that is more than 10 years old, but from my point of view, I have the impression that many of these issues are still open. So, for example, we would like to see a low uh, uh, overhead memory protection. In the standard PC, uh, this could involve reloading all of the page tables, and in a real-time operating system, we would like to have memory pr uh, protection that does not involve reloading all the page tables. Also, we would like to have temporal protection of computing resources. That means we would like to be able to define that a particular thread is allowed to run, let's say, for 100 micro microseconds. And if it doesn't finish within 100 microseconds, the, the processor uh, is uh, taken away from that thread. Uh, the real-time operating systems for on-chip multiprocessors are also an area of research. Uh, because we might have quite a number of different cores on, on, on one particular chip, and we don't want to have identical copies on, on each of these cores. Also, we cannot uh, tolerate to have just one main memory where we have a single copy of the operating system. So therefore, we have to find a good compromise between these approaches. Support for continuous media is, is another issue we would like to avoid having to uh, uh, switch uh, the context for each and every sample that is arriving from some input. And we would like to have a very flexible uh, trade-off between the quality of service and, and, and the other objectives that we might want to consider, like, for example, uh, the consumed energy or uh, the lifetime of the processor, the temperatures that we find there for, for the processor. So this concludes uh, the first part of uh, this lecture. Are there any questions? <laughs>